Excellent. Well, welcome everyone to our Pharma Communication Series under the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan. My name is Alison Watson and I'm very pleased to be moderating this session. I'm joined by a very diverse group of experts today to talk about pesticide behaviour, decision making and communication. And we have uh, many fantastic speakers actually, and so a very busy agenda. So we'll be moving through very quickly and we'll have lots of information to share. What's really exciting, I think, about today's session uh, as well is that we're going to have a look at lots of studies that are currently being conducted or about to start. So it gives you the chance to ask questions to these project leaders and potentially spot areas where you might have information or see opportunities for collaboration in the future. There are eight different speakers and each brings quite a different perspective on this important topic. Now, just before we start, I just want to run quickly through the Zoom platform. The key message to you is that we want to hear all your questions. So please make sure you put any questions to any of our speakers into the Q&A box. That's where we collate all those questions and it makes it a lot easier for us to manage the session if they all go in there and not the chat box. However, please use the chat box to share your ideas, your thoughts, your works, to thank a, speak your works, to thank a speaker, uh, to mention something that um, you think is important for us to consider. Uh, that's also very valuable. And please make sure you introduce yourself as well so we know who is in the room. Um, if you have any technical problems, you can try uh, giving uh, us a message in the chat box. You can also just try logging off and on. That, that often solves it. But we can't actually do much if you don't have a good connection. So I'm, I apologize if that is the case for you. Now, this is part three of a series to catalyze action on the development and design of more effective pharma communications on integrated pest management fall army and fall army worm control. We're actually at session 3B. Uh, it's been a very uh, productive, interesting series, and it's actually moving quite fast. So it's hard to believe we're already uh, in October. Um, if you want to uh, get a... Um, what am I going to say, a participation certificate from today, which many of you do, then what we ask you to do is provide feedback and questions in the Pharma Communication Forum. And you do that by going to our website, uh, you click on community, you click on forum, and you'll see a little uh, section there around pharma communication, and you can add your thoughts, share your ideas in that section, and we really encourage you to do that. Now, in our last session on 7th September, we shared work by a number of experts working on this issue from around the region and internationally. We had case studies from the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, Zambia, and Myanmar. And if you haven't seen this session, you can watch the video and see the presentation's PDF uh, at our pharma communication page. And I really encourage you to do so because there's some great presentations. We also learned that uh, pesticide use was significant across this region and heard case studies that pointed to the overuse or misuse of pesticides. And we learned about the importance of training and education programs. We noted that there was uh, less understanding of what the drivers and influences were as to how, what, and why farmers use agrochemicals. And we also found out that behavior involved a complicated set of factors as part of a broader system involving regulations, acts, access, affordability, market incentives, cultural social norms, perceptions of loss and risk, and a whole multitude of other factors. And so today we're back again, and we've got a new lineup of experts who are going to continue to shine a light on some of the work to better understand and drive new action towards responsible pesticide use. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, who is Dr. Lucy Carter from CSIRO Australia. Lucy uh, will talk about uh, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, ACIAR research project that she leads, which aims to develop an understanding of agrochemical use in Laos and Vietnam through a cross-country comparison of institutions and practices. And I understand that Lucy also has many of her team members online today. So if you are part of her team, if you could just put your hand up, um, that would be brilliant. You can do that on your control panel. That means I can identify you in the question time. Um, and I see a few participants already have raised their hands. So that's great. Lucy, welcome. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, great.
Can I just check, Alison, if you can see that? It's clearly. perfect, looking great. great. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Uh, it is afternoon here, so good morning if uh, it's morning for you or good evening if it's evening for, from wherever you are. I'm going to present some research design notes along with some findings from a quite an extensive literature review that we conducted as a project which we're now only just starting to embark on the data collection aspect. Our research activity, which is a small research activity, is funded by the Social Systems Program of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, or ACR, and the CIRO. And it's in collaboration with a host of research partners uh, who are online from both Laos and Vietnam, including VNUA, PPRI, and NIM in Vietnam, and NAFRI in Newall in Laos. While we're now only just starting to embark on the data collection, we've spent considerable time, um, close to nine or 10 months now, carefully designing our research approach and the lens from which we're studying agrochemical use. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. The project is also supported by reference groups in each country, which provide feedback on case study design and also enable a forum for government research and the private sector um, to, to uh, be informed of findings. I'll be presenting the talk today, but as Alison mentioned, I have my team online ready to answer all your questions. So thank you to my team for being there to support me today. So the project is focused on understanding the multiple and interrelated drivers of agrochemical use of which Alison mentioned some of those in her introductory um, presentation. And we're looking at use access and disposal and in particular how these drivers and practices influence one another. Both the Lao and Vietnamese governments are committed to reducing harmful use of agrochemicals and transitioning in some aspects to greener agriculture. However, there remain challenges for extension, particularly in governing safe use, including remoteness, for example, or resourcing, uh, market dynamics, including information chains, as you all know, play a significant role in determining farmer options for use, and they can undermine uh, government goals. Socio-cultural beliefs and norms also influence risk taking. So these factors won't be new to many of you on the call, um, but with our project, we're trying to work from a social systems lens. And in many ways, we're needing to step back from the position um, where the challenge remains with the need to inform or educate farmers about the dangers of use to a position where we're acknowledging that farmer education may have a role in safer use, but without attention to the broader dynamics of use, practice change will not occur. So we're very much building on the blocks of many others, including Rika Floor and Annie Shattuck, who've informed our research approach. And we're using a case study method to structure the research. So we've spent considerable time in finding the right research approach, uh, including constructing a systems framework, uh, which is informed by a social science lens. So a very human focused perspective using qualitative research approaches. So one of the first tasks that we completed was a literature review and it, it came in two parts. For the first part, across both countries, we set out to identify current policies, regulations and institutions relevant to use and existing information on patterns of use, including uh, extent and practices and how drivers determine agrochemical use. The second part of the review was focused on identifying existing systems-based frameworks for conceptualizing agrochemical use in the region that we are working. But I'll only speak on the first part of that literature review today because I think it's of most interest to those of, on the call. So it is very clear uh, then in our region, in Laos and Vietnam, there are laws, policies and extension programs in both countries that have a real focus on reducing agrochemical use. This is visible through recent consolidation of existing laws and regulations in Vietnam, for example, and an emphasis on green agriculture as a national goal in Laos. But despite the existence of these regulations and an emphasis on extension, the governance of use, especially pesticides at the local level is relatively weak. 
There are informal and illegal channels of product movement and information flow uh, that are present in both countries and the mechanisms for container disposal, for example, can be haphazard. There are obviously a number of social and economic transitions at play, particularly around household practices. And there are external um, uh, wider transitions that also affect use, including agricultural intensification, increased commercialization and climate change. There are social transitions such as rural outmigration and increasing engagement in non-farm livelihoods that are also impacting on the way that we use or the way that farmers use. Some of the market drivers also influence use um, as many on the call would already be ve very familiar with. Um, product appearance and quality can influence use. Um, and this may vary depending on the production system, of course, and market demand. Um, we are seeing the higher production demands in some instances have led to increased use, especially in upland areas. There is some evidence of emerging markets for safer products, for product traceability and controlled use of chemicals. But one of the most interesting and probably challenging points to emerge from our review is that users of agrochemicals are, are often viewed as the primary, as having primary responsibility for effective and safe use and often carry the burden uh, of exposure risk. And this is despite uh, evidence of product formulation, labelling and retail availability sometimes being inconsistent with existing expectations, standards and laws. There's quite a bit of literature on personal protective equipment, PPE, which is identified as important for risk reduction. Um, although much of the research that we came across spoke of equipment being substandard or advice not being consistently followed, or not aligned to farmer comfort or farmer risk beliefs. Uh, raincoats as pictured here are a common choice for PPE, particularly in Vietnam. A consideration that emerges across the broader literature is that users are often aware of risks, but these risks and options are not evaluated in isolation. So rather they're considered against a much larger range of values, risks and needs that shape individual use. This is um, our rather complicated systems framework I'm going to present for you today. Um, and it, it, I hope it conveys that diverse outcomes and impacts of agrochemical use are distributed unevenly across stakeholders and, and often change over time and is very dynamic. I've tried to animate uh, the framework, so hopefully it, it does work. It's developed from the results of our literature review and it takes a systems perspective um, and hopefully captures many of the actors in the system and the formal and informal institutions that influence use. So at the local scale, um, particular actors might be most prominent and for our project, the farming household is the focal point. There are a number of interactions and relationships that farming has, households have with um, providers of product and providers of information. And households are also influenced by changing environmental, economic and political drivers. At the outer scales, there are influences of use also, uh, for example, research agendas, government regulations, incentives, the private sector, all with their own priorities and agendas. And so even, uh, I must say that this is a simplified version of our map. Um, it might give you a headache to see the more complex version, but it's very much a work in progress. And what we're trying to do here is make sure we actually include uh, in our, our framing of the system, all of the various dynamics, uh, uncertainties, relationships and interactions that occur and influence agrochemical use in the system. A number of factors have influenced where our selection of case study sites have occurred. Um, and we've been very careful to include a mix of farming activities, uh, including those that are known to using agrochemicals, a mix of geographic characteristics, upland, lowland, 
rural and urban, as well as socioeconomic considerations to explore differences among ethnic groups, farming roles, commercial or subsistence crops. We're interested in obtaining a snapshot of agrochemical categories um, and as mentioned earlier, other actors who interact with farmers and who have been identified as important research participants uh, in the study across supply chain, regulatory environment and private sector. And that includes, of course, NGO and extension. A case study approach, we think, should be able to shed some light on these dynamics and interactions. In thinking about our case study design, the pandemic has meant that we've had to shift in considering how we conduct the research remotely, which has meant exploring digital methods of data collection, for example. Our research frame for each case study is designed to capture four key categories of information, extent of use, drivers of use, perceptions and beliefs, and information flow. We've decided to trial using some novel methods uh, like photo voice for capturing um, data from agrochemical users where farmers are potentially more encouraged, I think perhaps to share photographs of their use and practice. And the research discussion then is focused on farmer storytelling and the sharing of perspectives and knowledge and beliefs. And the researcher becomes a more passive participant in the research process. Uh, telephone and qualitative interviews um, are to be used for other actor groups. We, we have yet to see, we've piloted the photo voice methods, but we have yet to see how it plays out uh, on the broader scale. So we're hoping to be able to share some results with you uh, early in the year. Uh, and finally, um, thinking through some of the ethical considerations that are related to research design um, has led us to think and consider more deeply some of the potential risks that we need to manage during data collection and reporting of data. A COVID is the most obvious one, the risks to researchers and communities. Um, the spread of COVID has been spiking in both countries um, and healthcare systems globally are under pressure. So while vaccination is an uh, important risk mitigation measure, we all know that it's not 100% effective in controlling infection or spread. So what we did not want to do is expose the research team or our research participants to the risk of field work. And we definitely didn't want to um, risk accidentally bringing COVID into communities. The other risk that we've taken some time to discuss is collecting information about agrochemical use. Um, and that risk relates uh, to participants sharing um, illegal or un unsafe practice information um, that might not be in line with local recommendations. We think these risks are present for participants, perhaps mostly farmers at the risk of being fined or otherwise punished based on the information they provide us. Uh, as well as to local officials. Um, and the risk there we think might be shaming or punishment for those uh, in the area of responsibility for not following certain guidelines. So we have selected sites. We've got a detailed research protocol. Uh, we have got a great team online um, and we've started to pilot the methods. So we're now starting to make research connections in field on site. It's been quite a journey to get to this point, um, but I think we've got a really good, strong, solid research design base. And hopefully by March and April next year, we'll have some results to share more widely. Thank you to all my team, a uh, long list here, which I'm very lucky to have uh, a part of this project. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now. Excellent. Thank you, Lucy. Um, brilliant um, presentation. And it's great to have your team with you. I have I think I've allowed, I've seen some people here. I'm just going to allow them to talk if, if they would like to. They're, they're popping up on the screen, so that's good. Um, look, lots of really interesting information there. Uh, and I guess a couple of questions for you. I mean, you talked about the system um, and the different sort of I guess, burden of responsibility and power across the, the, the whole system. How can you shift, and, and some uneven power there across stakeholders, 
how do you think you can shift the burden of responsibility a little bit more evenly across those stakeholders? Mm, that's a great question. I don't want to do all the talking in this in this um, <laughs> session, so I'll let my team try and answer that if they feel comfortable answering that question. I think for our small project, um, the best that we can do in uh, is inform others of some of the drivers and some of the uh, power dynamics as sensitively as we possibly can, because it is a challenging topic. Um, I. I'm not sure it can, it is possible for one actor or one sector to actually shift power. I think there are cultural shifts that need to happen. Um, but I, I think it's very much dependent on time uh, and very much also dependent on um, uh, shared responsibility for change. But I will shush now and let my colleagues talk. Thank you, Alison. Which, um, I'm just wondering, who would like to, would you like to nominate one of your colleagues, you, Lucy? I've got some other questions oh, as well, too. So. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, but perhaps Na or Liam, if you're happy to respond. Hi. I'm sorry, my connection wasn't poor, so I could not uh, hear the question. Could you please repeat? Yeah, hi, Na. It was really just around how can you uh, more uh, evenly, I guess, shift power so that people have a more shared burden of responsibility, rather than putting all the burden of responsibility on farmers largely, uh, can we shift that burden around so that people share the load, I guess, or the burden? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I I. I, I think uh, we used to use the value chain approach in studying and uh, not the only the responsibility of the farmer, mm -hmm. but all the actors in the chain and all the supporter, meaning that um, uh, why, uh, when farmer try to, uh, to adopt like a good agriculture practice for vegetable and, and rice production. But if the, the other market actor uh, don't, uh, cannot bring the, the product to the right, the consumer that who willing to pay for that. So the farmer will not have incentive to produce the, the good quality uh, um, products. And uh, also uh, we also need the, uh, the intervention from the government who would uh, control the uh, the quality of the pro the product uh, from uh, uh, from market uh, from produ uh, produ uh, production area to the market. So it's not only the farmer, but it's uh, the responsibility of all the actors and the supporter of the the, the product value chain. Yep, excellent, great answer. Uh, another question here, um, and, and now you, you or Liam, you may be able to answer this. How, how easy is it to reach farmers and how receptive are they to talking about their pesticide use? Liam, are you talking to farmers directly or? Or maybe Lucy, have you found, what, what's your feedback on that? So um, we haven't, st we've just begun in the field. Um, yep. So I'd probably let Na answer that question. Okay. Oh, and I can see Liam has just unmuted. He, he may have a connection problem, but we've got two uh, possible respondents now. Excellent. Okay, sorry, so sorry to interrupt you because we just uh, celebrated uh, 29 years of uh, Vietnamese women. So I would like to give this chance for some uh, lady from Vietnam side to say. But uh, you, you know that uh, PPI are working with the farmer very frequently because we have a lot yep. of different kind of uh, research work uh, and uh, extension activity. So um, actually uh, PPI uh, staff can you know, meet and uh, talk to farmer very uh, often. 
and uh, uh, we usually you uh, conduct by face to face meeting. Um, and uh, now due to the COVID, so maybe the the way to uh, interact with farmer may be changed. But uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, relationship with uh, local people, uh, including. Uh, you know, uh, extension staff from local and uh, little from uh, local people. So it's easy for us to contact and um, have a exchange, uh, exchange information with the farmer. But I, I prefer to work uh, with them directly by face to face through the uh, daily activity. Excellent. So that face-to-face -face contact is obviously really important. Um, there's a couple of questions here. Maybe, Lucy, this might be a question for you. Um, and it was a little bit around what the photo voice technology, I think, was. What were you meaning by that? And what were the challenges you needed to resolve? Or you may still be in the process, I think, of resolving them. I'm not sure. But could you just describe that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alison. Um, so it's a me method that I haven't used personally, but my colleagues have used um, very much in the Indigenous research space. Um, and the focus really is on um, changing the research dynamic where the research participant, so in this case the farmer, is able to share their perspectives and beliefs using photos that they um, have taken. So in our case, we are asking um, farmers to take a photo over a period of time, so two weeks. Um, take, for example, and uh, this is just an example, five photos that might describe something that you like about uh, agrochemical use or something that is beneficial to you. Five photos or ten photos that you um, find challenging or dislike about agrochemical use and then choose two out of that number. Uh, and the, um, the researcher then has a discussion about uh, uh, those two photographs. And the discussion, so there are, of course, guiding questions. It's not an interview. There are four focal guiding questions that we have chosen in our methodology. Um, and, and they're more uh, open-ended um, invitations to uh, tell the researcher the story that the photo um, brings. So it's very much a challenge, I think, in that we're not absolutely certain that it's going to generate exactly the information we need. It's going to take some time for us to practice and see if it works quite well. But we're very keen to try and practice using this because we think it's going to work better remotely. But we also think it shifts the power a bit. It's less of an interview. It's more of a tell us your story um, and some of the challenges or some of the, you know, the benefits that you have. Um, so it's, you know, I think in that sense, it shifts power a bit, but we've yet to trial it. So we can okay. definitely tell you how it goes. Great. Uh, and I've got one more question for you, Lucy, and this is going to be a question for Delissa as well when we get to um, Crop Life Asia, but it was a question um, really around the responsibility of pesticide applications. We were talking about how a lot of that burden is on pesticide users, the farmers. Is there any, um, I, I was thinking of disposal too of, of pesticide mm. containers, but is there any um, discussion or work that's out there, and, and there may be, I don't know, um, around extended producer responsibility or responsibility for the manufacturers to actually make sure these things are looked at? So we did dive into that literature. Our literature focused on uh, looking at farmer use and farmer practice. I am certain there'd be literature out there on that topic. Um, so I think probably that that might be, you know, a, a next phase in terms of just thinking about um, opening up that discussion about shared responsibility. At the moment, we really needed to be quite focused on our um, scope. It is a small yep. research activity and it's very short in timeline, but I, I'd be surprised if there wasn't literature on that topic out there. 
Okay, and to listen, maybe I have to share something with us later. Um, there's another question in there for you, Lucy, to maybe answer in writing or one of your group around gender. But I think what we'll do now is move on to our next speaker. I'd like to thank you and for you and your team for joining us. It's, it's great Thanks, to Alice. see all three of you uh, with us. And I'm sure there may even be some more actually um, hidden in the audience there that I haven't managed to uh, locate. But thank, thank you, you very much and good luck in your research. Thanks. So our next speaker today is Zhengzhu Ren, who is sharing with us today a review on the factors influencing Chinese farmers' proper pesticide application in agricultural products. Now, there's been quite a few studies looking at farmer pesticide use in China over the last decade, over 200 or so. Uh, and I know Zhengzhu looked at all of those and collated them and then went down and, and further searched through them for some really interesting findings. So welcome to the room. If you could share your uh, presentation now, that would be very, that'd be very helpful. Okay, thank you, Edison. I'm going to share my screen. And Edison, please help me check if my share screen is going well. Perfect. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Galatia, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ying Xue Ren from Tiankong University. And I'm going to share our recent uh, publication on food control named Factors Influencing Chinese Farmers' Proper Pesticide Application in Agriculture Product. It's basically a review. And uh, this is a collaboration work between Tiankong University and the Wageningen University from Netherlands. And this is my online. Before we say something critical on pesticide, here is a question. Why we use pesticide from the first place? Because it saves our crops, right? Over 33% of worldwide agricultural products are saved because of pesticide. However, they cause damages. Pesticide residue, that's one of the most, and in Europe, over 2,000 food safety alert notification were concerned about pesticide residue to between 2015 to 2020. And that's only regarding fruit and vegetables. So there could be more. As one of the biggest producer and user of pesticide, China, we also face the similar problem. Pesticide contamination in food, that's one of the main causes of food safety incident in China. And many cases of export rejection are because of pesticide residue. And according to previous studies, the possible causes of the overuse or abuse of pesticide could be pesticide control, pe could be pest control, uh, could be financial reasons, uh, et cetera. Our research, we aim to get a comprehensive understanding of what factors influence appropriate pesticide application of farmers in China. So first things first, we need to demarcate our research. So we focus on fruits and vegetables because they are more vulnerable and requires pesticide control. And then we focus on chemical pesticide, which is the most common pesticide in China amongst all types. And after that, we need to build a framework as our lens, our glasses, which help us to clarify the mess. And uh, in our case, there is a combined model between uh, theory of plant behavior model and the techno -man managerial models. The, tech, uh, the theory of plant behavior model, also known as TPB for short, this model explained that a person's intention to conduct a behavior is the outcome of attitude towards behavior, the social norms, and the perceived behavior control. <clears throat> and once the intention combined with the perception with behavior control leads to actual behavior in the end. So since our study focused on the farmer's application as farmers is the most likely person to actually apply the pesticide. So the TPB model seems like a suitable model that can give us a deeper insight of factors contributed to their intentions and the behavior. And in this research, the behavior can be understood as proper pesticide application, uh, like using legal pesticide with safe dose. And intention could be understood as non-compliance of proper pesticide application, however, Farmers' behavior is not only the outcome of their intention, but also affect that external 
environment, like uh, how the government regulate them, how the external support them, how the stakeholder require them, and other technological factors. And to support a more comprehensive analysis, the techno managerial approach is combined to the TPB model. And this model involves the integration analysis to food quality management issues from both technological perspective and managerial perspectives. And this approach intends to explain how these behavior are influenced from both sides. And uh, next one, we choose our battlefield. This is the stages of uh, primary production. And uh, when we think about pesticide application, and uh, that is our focus. Now we got our lens, we got our target. It's time to dive into literature. We designed a literature review strategy to collect our studies, and uh, which is described in these two pages. Long story short, after four round of selections, we yield out 45 articles, and then we go through literatures to find out what factors are there and how they influence farmers' behavior regarding like pesticide application, pesticide use, and we categorize them into different parts of our framework, and we got this. So first, as we assumed, the pesticide application is the result of the interaction between multiple actors, like the farmers, of course, but also the input suppliers, the government, the cooperative, and the neighbors, public, all of them, they're all involved. That's exactly the definition of complex systems, which requires a system approach to analyze, like our framework. And uh, one example from our result regarding the uh, literature literature find out most of the articles demonstrate that farmers experience positively linked to their knowledge, since knowledgeable farmers are more likely to conduct a uh, pesticide application properly. And similarly, education level explains the same things. And another example from the TPB elements is that farmer concern on crop yield as one of the main reason for overuse pesticide. And some articles also suggest that farmer may reduce pesticide use when they are worried about their own health situation or believe that helped increase product quality. And subjective norm like pressures from the surrounding peoples, from neighbors, from public, are find contributed to regulate farmers' intention to comply with proper behavior. Well perceived the behavior control showed relatively fewer efforts. And another example from the techno managerial model elements, results shows that the important role of the government support and external service support. Many articles support, uh, supported that strictly regulation enforcement contributed to more correct use of pesticide. And having access to support and training provided by external service support farmer to obtain more information and therefore comply with the proper use of pesticide. But however, unfortunately, literature about the technology condition are quite limited. Considering the complexity of pesticide application as we illustrate here, we are convinced that it's not an easy way to improve farm's behavior overnight. So a stepwise approach may be helpful to achieve the final goal through smaller efforts, which are more feasible. So we came up with the idea that uh, the proper step-by-step intervention that uh, farmers cannot change all of their circumstances at the same time. So maybe, the investment in training, in equipmenting, and all those costly time consuming efforts can be made step by step. That's more relaxing. And the proposed intervention for each stage uh, could be further differentiated because of their concern with different actors, like I mentioned before, farmers, suppliers, and the government extension service, they are all part of this. They all take steps to go further from the intermediate stage to eventually advanced stages. So each contributes differently to the problem of high pesticide residue, and each can be implied differently intervention to mitigate the problem. And that will be um, our recent studies. Any questions?
Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, mm. uh, uh, if you could just go back to the mm. slide before, because um, I think that's a great slide just to end on, actually, um, because that to me is really interesting, these stepwise uh, mm -hmm. interventions. Uh, and Thank I think, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very, very good. Um, a couple of questions um, that are coming through. One is, um, how important, I guess, did you find in the literature was the educational level and experience and knowledge of the farmer to their use of pesticides? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's quite complex and, and oh, really good questions. Thank you. Mm, because uh, when we go through the literature so regarding the experience of farmers itself or their families, if yeah. they have some experience about uh, pesticide poisons themselves or something they're very close to, like neighbors, families, they will pay attention to the proper pesticide application. That's one part. And yeah. the other part is if they are uh, experience that we use overuse or abuse pesticide will came up with a more profitable crop yield they will over continue to overuse and abuse the pesticide so it's like they have two coins of the uh, two sides of the coins regarding the knowledge and educations Yep, excellent answer. Very good. And um, with regard to the external influences, how strong was that influence of sellers to mm -hmm. farmers' decision to apply pesticides? A lot, honestly, a lot. Uh, because most of the farmers we uh, from the literatures, they live on farming, so there will be uh, most uh, uh, most of their incomes are from what they grow. So the uh, crop yields and how they sell, how much they sell, there comes a lot. But uh, uh, mm, surprisingly, that the quality which will be regard, will, which will be transferred into a price premium, have not been ring alar alarm to the farmers. Uh, in another word, they uh, get the sense that if the quality is good or better, we can get a better price. We can sell with a higher price with a price prime, but. It's not that uh, one plus one equals two simple to them. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point. And, and listen, somebody had a question here just back about yeah. the farmer um, use of pesticides. W did you find any correlation between the safe use of pesticides by farmers and their education level? Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, by the education level, we mean the education level specified in pesticide control, not uh, about the college and uh, the post college. Uh, it's most like, uh, have you ever been specific training for pesticide use provided by the government or provided by the external service like the NGOs or some local input suppliers? Yeah. Excellent. Positive. Great. Yeah, positive. Okay, great. Uh, excellent to have that feedback. And um, a question here, I think mm. it's in this um, stepwise uh, chart with the intermediate stage. Um, mm -hmm. The I think here it mentions the potential use of subsidies to help farmers transition to alternatives. Mm -hmm. How important do you think this could be? Uh, honestly, I think this will be extremely uh, Maybe more more important than the final advanced stage because that's something helped to go through from the uh, where you started to where you want to be and this may be not a point state point like this point we go to it may be a period someone will go through a long time to uh, make their efforts to invest to invest in equipment investing yeah. training invest in their knowledge informations there will be a time consuming and uh, also money costly uh, yeah yeah i think there okay. will be yeah Great, Extreme. excellent. One, oh. one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Did you find, was there any literature or any feedback on the role of gender, like differences mm -hmm. between male and female farmers and pesticide use in China? Well, uh, we found, but it is not that significant statistically. So uh, yeah, there will be literature uh, refer to that because most of our uh, men who do the pesticide application because of their some health risk. You need to wear a mask, carry some equipment on your backs. But uh, uh, we also have some literature point out because most of men have went out of the village to go for a high paid job in the city and the women are 
the one who carry on all this farming back home. So yeah. Okay, great. And actually, I'm going to ask you one more question. Yes, uh, and it's and it's around also this intermediate stage. We talked about subsidies, but what mm -hmm. do you think is the, do you think it's important that role of crop insurance schemes for mm -hmm. transitioning to alternatives to pesticides? I think that's a, how to say, and that's a terrific idea to bring the crop insurance into this part because we, we uh, I don't think we have a bad, done a great job here so far. Uh, and their insurance can help the farmers to transfer the risk from themselves and to the insurance company. And so far, this part of work are done by the government. And I think we are putting too much pressure on them because uh, they are not, uh, uh, how to say, they cannot do this forever, right? They are only here to help you to start, maybe get better, but there will be a day. There definitely be a day the government should stay back. You have to leave the market to do their work themselves. So okay. I think that there will be a time for insurance to take place of the government subsidy. So there okay. will. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation for sharing exactly. that with us. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And um, thank you um, from all of us. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions that are coming through later as well. So so please uh, feel free yeah. to answer any of those. Thank sure. you very much, uh, Zhengzhou. Thank you. Yeah, I also have my screen sharing. Okay, great. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. So if people could just bear with me. And I'll just move through quickly without making people feel dizzy. Uh, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who's our project assistant on the ASEAN Action Plan, Putra Indika. And for this presentation, it's not based on a full comprehensive research study. Um, what we wanted to do was just shine a light on a very specific element of this larger agrochemical system. And that is pricing and how that might influence farmer behavior. Um, so just please take it in that light. It's really just to get us speaking about things and, and talking. Um, and we're really keen to hear your views about this specific topic. So I'm going to ask you at the very end to um, share some of your thoughts in the chat. So Putra, can you um, unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, Alison. Great. Hi. <laughs> okay. So may I start now, Alison? Yes. Okay. Please do. Okay, thank you. Greeting everyone. So my name is Ignatius Putrandika, and I am a lecturer at the Department of Biology, Universitas of Atmajaya Yogyakarta, which is located in Indonesia, absolutely. And allow me to share my experience working with farmers and hopefully could spark some ideas, discussions, or as a reflection to the conditions in other regions. Next, please. So the webinar series held by Croatia has shown many ways on how farmers decide on what pesticides they actually use. And these are quite similar on what happens in Indonesia. So pesticide salesperson, they do actually go to the field. They do actually meet farmers. They are able to help events and give away merchandise and sometimes products. However, um, it is true that they sometimes are biased, um, which, is, which makes sense because they do have their selling targets. And then agricultural stores are important. Um, a farmer may simply go into a store and ask, what is the solution to my pest problem? And then the store owner would give a solution. And uh, honestly, there are some store owners that are quite knowledgeable because they do have background in uh, agriculture and they do have experience. And again, what other farmers are doing or using does matter. So information exchange between farmers may happen through uh, farmer group meetings or simply by a farmer walking to the field, um, seeing a healthy field, asking the owners, what are you using? And then by copying that. And then another way is through extension officers. However, there are anecdotes of of officers not being able to state any brands, um, specific brands and only be able to state active ingredients. And then farmers will consider those as um, not quite helpful because they're not um, stating any brands. So besides all of those previous stated ways, something else that is interesting to look at is whether or not prices of insecticides may affect the insecticide choice of farmers in certain production systems. And then whether some active ingredients are more available than others and are actual the farmer demands of insecticides, do they actually have any effect to the markets? Next, please. So this data is adapted from the study of Bami and her colleagues in 2020 that did a survey on insecticide use in the Tadarum River. 
So although there are differences between the number of crop samples, you can see that there are patterns between some crops. So for example, a chili pepper that is a cash, cash crop in Indonesia, um, the use of insecticides are focused on two active ingredients, while on rice, well, it is a stable crop and so many farmers plant them and so many people eat them, you can see more variety of um, the insecticides they use. And then when you see across the crops, you can see that there are two groups that tend to stand out, which are organophosphates and pyrethroids. And then when you start to look at um, the regulations and registered insecticides, yes, these are some insecticides that are registered in Indonesia. And a colleague and I have submitted a paper to Agriculta Journal of Agricultural Science that actually talks about these registered insecticides and is currently in review. So next, please. So let's start to talk about an actual pest. So this case study is on the rice leaf folder mod. Um, the graph shows um, the price per application compared to the actual price of insecticides when they are used at recommended concentrations. So the price that we got that we got here are actually found from the internet, uh, one of the easiest ways to get information these days. And what you can see is that um, insecticides from carbamates and pyrethroids um, have lower price per applications um, compared to um, something from diatomites or most of the ivermectins or spinosins, which are considered as urinsecticide groups. And these cheaper groups also have the advantage to say um, when somebody is selling them to them is that this can target more pests than later ones. So at the end, that might be able to affect um, farmers' uh, decision on what insecticides to choose. And another interesting question about um, this is, is this pattern similar with other crops or other pests? And we currently don't know because we're still looking um, through it. Next, please. So from those data, um, here are some food for thoughts. So does availability of certain active ingredients affect what farmers are using? So for example, if an active ingredient is registered more for more brands in Indonesia, does that actually translate to what farmers are using in the field? So that's a question. And then are cheaper prices combined with broad spectrum characteristics more attractive to certain farmer classes, such as depending on um, what they're planting, is it a stable crop, is it a cash crop, or um, the scale of their planting, is it small, medium, or um, large? And if price does not matter, who are we actually asking? Is it a rice farmer with low profits or a cash crop farmer that plants chili or shallot or even a medium scale farmer that in terms of economic aspects are a little bit more stable? So I think those are some of the questions that are really important to answer. And price and availability may be another factor to consider when talking about pesticide choice. And at the end, we hope with this information, we can later, uh, reduce the use of pesticide overall and only use them when they are really required. And next please. And at last, I would like to thank Ruasi again for the opportunity and of course my institution, University of Atmajaya, Yogyakarta. Thank you everyone for your attention. Excellent, thanks Putra. And I hope that's just given a bit of food for thought. We'd be really interested in hearing uh, in the chat box, what you think uh, is the um, influence uh, around or the influence of pricing uh, and availability uh, towards farmers use and decision making around pesticides and I see quite a few people as well from the industry there that might have some thoughts to share so if you could do that in the chat that would be good I was going to uh, ask a poll but I think I'm going to move forward because I'm we're going to run out of time but just again, please share your thoughts around this. Is pricing uh, something that we need to be looking at in more detail and also availability? And how do we shift farmers, uh, their choices uh, towards more, uh, less toxic uh, or more precision application of pesticides? So there's a question for you. If you could share those in the chat, please, that would be great. Uh, and we would really appreciate that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to our next uh, presentation uh, and we are very lucky today to have Dr. Yves Bureau-Point who's a researcher uh, in the CNRS in Marseille, France and in this presentation Eve's going to share some of her research on the sociality between humans, pesticides and the environment in Cambodia. Welcome Eve. If you could share your presentation. I'm trying, but it's already, it's, it's okay. Yes. 
it's coming. Okay. Is it okay for you? Yes, it is. It's perfect. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Alison, for your invitation. Huh? I'm doing research on, on health issue in Cambodia since 2005, and I've started to work on the issue of pesticides since 2018, when pesticides start to become a, a key issue, a key concern for the population. That's why I, I came to, to this topic. And I was uh, noticing a big awareness of the exponential use of chemical in agriculture. And it was profoundly changing the human being. And for the anthropologist I am, it was really uh, important to, to study how human beings are changing through the introduction and the intensive use of pesticide in Cambodia. It was uh, changing the relationship to the body, to health, to work, to the environment, and more widely to the social and political world. Um, in my research, I focus on social dynamics, um, more especially on the social construction of health problem related to pesticide in the context of Cambodia. You may think that pesticides are not only problem. Indeed, in the history of pesticide, they have been a key component of the modernization of agriculture. It has helped to cover the food needs of a growing population after war times and so on. However, like pharmaceutical, pesticides are pharmacon, a Greek concept that refer to ambivalent substances that are both remedy and poison. As in my fieldwork in Cambodia, pesticides start to become and to be perceived as a danger for health and the environment, I decided to study this process of problem construction. I follow um, in this research the theoretical framework of the social construction of public problem, like some colleague, French colleague, uh, such as Daniel Sefai, Francis Chateaurino, Yannick Jaffre. And this framework is built on the central idea that problems are the product of a construction work carried out by a plurality of actors. In my research, it's mean farmers, but also pesticide sellers, producers, monks, health professionals, scientists, politicians, and so on. And they are in permanent interconnection themselves, like Lucy just before uh, show. And uh, they are in interconnection in a particular environment. And I will discuss today the importance of this framework to analyze the pesticide problem. Just a few words on the, on the method. In Cambodia, because problems were start to be more visible at the local scale, at the micro social scale, than compared to the political scale. Then I study micro social interaction at farmer scale, domestic scale, pesticide seller scale, but also consumer scale. And I look at different questions related to chemical experience, understanding of toxicity, history of the use of pesticide, and the use of pesticide in different models of uh, production. As you can see, the different interview I did uh, in Cambodia during nine months. Um, it was mostly open-ended uh, interview and observation at Phnom Penh and also in three provinces, Baton Bang because it's well known as a rice bowl of Cambodia, uh, Kandal province because it's well known for intensive use of pesticide in vegetable production and uh, food production. And Zvairiang, it was more to follow some families um, practicing um, subsistence farming. Uh, then today I would like to, uh, time being short, I, I will not go deep in, deep on the topic, but I will try to be synthetic and focus on key message based on this research. Uh, if we listen to consumer, to general population, to the firms, but also at the press, the opinion, not only in Cambodia, it's to think that farmer would be responsible for the pollution of the planet and the health consequence. We can often hear farmer must stop using pesticide 
It sounds really simple. For sure, there is a lot to do nearby the farmer to help them to accompany them in their agricultural practices. However, today I would like to highlight the fact that the problem is more global and structural, inherent to pesticide technology, inherent to the model of agrochemical agriculture, which is adopted not only by farmers, but by a panoply of stakeholders since decades. Then what should be taken into account? The global history of chemical industry. Indeed, the global north step-by-step step convinced the global south to use agrochemical. And now many components of society from citizens, farmer to political entities try to turn back from pesticide. However, it's so complex, slow, and uneasy. Then we are talking about global circulation of knowledge and technologies with shared responsibilities related to the uncontrolled effect of pesticide. We are also to take into account the temporality of the global market versus the temporality of Cambodian authorities to produce laws, rules, and code of conduct. Indeed, like in other global South countries, the market of pesticide grow faster than the national means to apply the rules. Then it's not surprising that pesticide pollution is not controllable and not because of farmer knowledge, but rather because not only about um, farmer knowledge, but also and rather because of economic and market dynamics. Many efforts are done to improve regulation However, technical and financial means to test a product before authorization and during post-marketing control are insufficient for the states like Cambodia, like in other global South countries. Moreover, the everyday life of farmers with pesticide shows that even if regulation is reinforced, there is a long drive before making appropriate regulation to farmers' realities. I've noticed that the good practices are defined locally in contact with pesticide sellers, in contact with social familial network, and through experience, and less with labels, protective equipment, and so on. I would like to, to mention one extract of interview with a vegetable producer who said, Wearing the raincoat makes us sweat hot and it doesn't make us feel well. It can also make us unconscious. It makes us not breathing well. Like sometimes our breath is faster than normal. And because of that, the raincoat, it will make us absorb more tnampol, it's mean poison in Khmer. But if we don't wear, we can pause our, our breathing and can avoid. At the end, it seems that the concept of safe use reflect on label and the use of personal protective equipment is a market tool developed by firms and regulation entities based on the idea that proper use of pesticide can prevent most harm. And we can be critical with this idea. Science showed today that pesticides have already altered our bodies and our environment and that safe use is more like a fiction. In Cambodia, I've noticed the trust in label, uh, that it's really the trust is really relative. We have another extract of interview from a pesticide seller who said some companies, they are just playing around, putting this or that in, and we don't know what kind of TNAM, it's mean uh, pesticide chemical, they are selling all this for profit and they can sell at a cheaper price compared to other companies. The quality of the product on the market then is variable, and we have to consider that, like we hear this morning already, uh, that uh, farmers prefer cheap products. Another point uh, that we have to take into account, the persistent imperceptibility of the real damage of pesticide. Biomedical scientists had already provided a lot of causal links between some pesticide and health. 
However, the fact that pesticide induce many long-term effects create permanent uncertainty. We hardly know if we are sick because of pesticide or something else. This offer a, a favorable context for the reinforcement of the model of chemical agriculture. Social scientists also notice the slowness of the regulatory entities to ban pesticides. The precautionary principle is also rarely applied. Uh, then what we can do for a better equilibrium between food production and respect of health and environment. Increase farmer knowledge of safe use of pesticides, increase the means of controlling these dangerous technologies, uh, reform the dominant agricultural um, model of production. Efforts are being done in this direction. However, my key message today is that farmers need a company accompaniment and support without being the scapegoat of an invisibilized shared global problem. My key message is then a call to think the problem through its complexity as a structural and system systemic problem by looking at local practices where micro and macro are intertwined and where agency and responsibility are shared. It is short, but I hope this uh, reminder in this workshop can help to see the issue of pesticide in Asia. Thank you very much. That was not short, it was perfect. So thank you so much for that presentation and some really interesting quotes from the field as well, which I think are really powerful at understanding how farmers are thinking and interpreting um, their experiences with pesticides and their use. So thank you very much, Eve. I've got quite a few questions for you. Um, one of them is you mentioned that struggle between the international community setting standards, norms, new rules and expectations, um, including in the marketplace and the interpretation and implementation of those at country level is very challenging, um, particularly in developing countries. So. What do you think are some of the ways we can help support governments and institutions at local level to implement those policy and regulations? You talked about that difficulty between international expectations and then the implementation at the local level. I would like to reply by saying that international, it's a really wide thing and that international, it's always local. And finally, there is always a big translation and uh, it's really hard to, to have um, uh, general advice for local situation. And we are we dealing with a really hard issue, pesticide, because it's uh, dangerous, not yet uh, in different way for each pesticide. And this is a really uh, complex technology to, to uh, to develop all over the world. And uh, it's uh, maybe uh, uh, an ideal to think that um, we can, uh, the human can uh, control this technology. Uh, and I think it's more complex in some countries where markets go really fast instead of uh, all um, in parallel to all the regulation uh, effort and some in some contexts it's really hard to to implement such control that pesticide need okay great and, and just getting no that's excellent and i mean it's very complex i think that's come through in all the presentations this is real systemic issues here to deal with um but one piece of really useful information you talked about uh, you'd seen some good examples at local level where people, the farmers had worked together with local sellers, for example, um, or, and, and actually that some of those examples at local level were quite successful um, at coming up with solutions or um, I guess practices that were more responsible. How do you build that trust, do you think, um, between at, at local level, between those actors? the farmers, the local sellers, uh, the government officials, the extension agents? I would like to say that I met a lot of different sellers and some are also farmers. 
uh, in the same family and some really want to transmit good advice and they experience in the field the product and they will give good advice even if there is uh, it's always always a pro there is also the question of profit driven uh, advice but they are also responsible and try to do their best but they are all different we can find everything in at this level of pesticide seller and sometimes we can also um, notice that uh, when there is some bad ban uh, pesticide or new new interdi interdiction uh, it's sometimes really long to to access all the local uh, seller all over the country and sometimes they are they yeah the information uh, is uh, it's really slow to transmit all this new information but i think even scientists don't know all the <coughs> uh, uh, pervasive effect of pesticides so uh, we it's hard to focus only on regulation because even at the science scientist level we don't know all the danger uh, of this substance and we always discover new new uh, side effect of pesticide okay it's a very good point we're still kind of finding out a lot more about what the impacts are uh a question here it's sort of raised in the chat actually there's quite a lot of chat discussion uh and one of the questions was around or one of the points was i guess it's around the professionalization of pesticide application so do you think it could be a solution to take at take away the application of pesticides from farmers and somehow professionalize that in a more, I guess, in a different model where farmers themselves aren't applying pesticides, but maybe trained uh, extension service agents are doing it? Um, it's a good question, but hard to reply how we can um, professionalize professionalize more and more the, the use of pesticide. I think um, our energy maybe uh, uh, would be to focus on uh, how we can use less and less this um, uh, invasive uh, product in food production. Maybe it can be um, easier to reduce uh, health and environment risk. And one last question, um, uh, Eve, is a question here. You talked about this lack of real understanding, I guess, about the negative impact of pesticides, that imperceptibility. What, what's driving that? Is it just because we don't know enough? As you say, just you said this just before, we still are finding out more information and, and learning what some of the impacts are. Um, or is it around the perceptions that if it doesn't hurt me or I don't feel like it's impacting me, then I don't feel there's an impact. I mean, what do you, how, how do you break that, that barrier? I'm not sure I understood well the question about um, pesticide yeah. and pers damage. Yeah, ha exactly. How would you break that imperceptibility about the, the impacts of pesticides? I think it's really uh, expensive research done all over the world by environment uh, uh, scientists, bio biomedical scientists, uh, by uh, um, biological scientists, toxicological, and so on. But we still don't know enough, and we always discover the uh, uh, health effect. Uh, um, and environment effect of pesticides. So we have to keep in mind that it's, ha it's uh, how we can control. Uh, we can always try to go uh, to a better control, but finally uh, uh, it's uh, just uh, like uh, uh, social science, huh? art science, art social science moving all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation and good luck. I know that you're wanting to go back uh, or come back to the region uh, and carry on with your work. So good luck with that. And thank yeah. you for thank you for sharing um, for sharing your thoughts today. It was, it's excellent. <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup.
So I'd now like to introduce our next speaker and what we're going to do now is we're actually going to do something a little bit different in that we're going to have three speakers in a row um, and then we're going to have questions. So each speaker is going to give sort of a five minute six minute uh, presentation um, or discussion on, on their work and then we'll have time to ask them questions and so please put questions in the Q&A box they're each going to give quite a different perspective on on work that they're going to be doing in the future um, so this is a really good opportunity to see what's being planned but also see what might be of interest to you as well and potential collaboration in the future so I'm going to ask Delissa if you would like to start and share your screen um, welcome, uh, Delissa is uh, uh, from Crop Life Asia, uh, and she has actually um, participated in an earlier session that we had around uh, behaviour and farmer decision making. So it's brilliant to have you back. It was a great presentation last time, so I'm really looking forward to to, to today. Thanks. Thank you, Alison. Uh, so maybe before I begin my presentation, you had a question directed for me. Uh, oh, yes. Previously. So I, maybe I could answer that. So the question as a recap was, what is the responsibility of who is responsible for safe application of pesticides? And uh, that also you, you asked whether that would include the, the post uh, post consumer phase, which is when they do the disposal. So I would say that at Crop Life, we believe that stewardship or um, the safe practices in agriculture uh, follows the entire life cycle of the pesticide. And that means that at different stages, there will be different people responsible. So obviously at the beginning where we talk about the, the chemical manufacturing, uh, yes, you know, there's been a lot of studies and along the decades of work, pesticides have become safer less hazardous. Uh, in terms of the risk levels, uh, classification have, have gone uh, lower on the risk classification scale. Um, and then of course, to do with product design, the way that the item is being packaged, the way that the mouth of the product dis uh, dispenses the pesticides will all also relate to how much uh, quantity is being used by the consumer. And then of course, when it comes to the application itself, uh, that's where we do a lot of farmer and retailer training. Um, the government is also involved in in many of these stages in uh, crafting the kind of regulation uh, to ensure the safe use, but also to ensure that uh, new innovations that are safer, less risky are also put into the market faster. There was a question in Q&A on the registration process and that the first country to country, obviously the trials take a while, but um, a lot of times uh, it is the government that if, if they're able to approve them quicker, it gets to market quicker and gives farmers more of the access to those uh, safer pesticides. Okay, just, uh, and then just, of oh, sorry, no, I was going to ask you one question too, so I'll let you finish and then I'll... All right, uh, and then at, at the final stage, uh, where we talk about the disposal, that also requires a lot of care because uh, pesticides are inherently uh, toxic in its content uh, because it's, it's meant to, to manage pests. And for, for that reason, again, like there is the farmers are also responsible for disposing it correctly. The government is also responsible for creating the infrastructure for so and, and the producers themselves have this extended producer responsibility to help to uh, do this infrastructure to, to also finance that infrastructure for collection and disposal. Uh, but in many countries where there's extended producer responsibility models, not just for pesticides, but for many other products that could be toxic in nature, like electronics, batteries, um, there is usually uh, professional waste collectors and manage, management companies that are also in the picture. So uh, I think there is an uh, entire life cycle that we have to look at. And at different stages, different people are responsible and have to work together to, for, the, for the safe use of pesticides. Alison, I'll pass back to you for, for your next question. No, thank you. That was actually my question, actually. And I guess, um, I mean, that all sounds good. And, and, and I know you're doing lots of work there. Um, but this seems to still be a problem. So what is the industry doing to... Uh, so really, what, what do you, which well, I mean, I'm you thinking because it's come up a few times in the chat around disposal of the containers, for example. Is it worse in some countries or is there a specific program that you're looking at or are you looking at this in more detail around really um, focusing in and helping to clean that problem up or is it not a problem? It, I think it's, it's a very complex issue in many of the countries in Asia where we're trying to, to pilot container management systems these things actually take years and places where they are already established, it took about 
10 years, you know, for it to become full-fledged. There are many operational issues, a lot of cost issues that, that come into play. We also have a lot of smallholder farmers. So at the beginning of the, of the product life cycle, uh, there is a lot of control because it is uh, controlled by a number of manufacturers. But the moment it goes right down to the farms, you know, at the small level, smallholder farmers, the infrastructure is obviously lacking in many places. To be honest, you know, plastic reduction, plastic recycling, these yeah. are very new issues, not just to agriculture, but the entire world as we are trying to uh, resolve climate issues. So I would think that a lot of education needs to go into, into this program. It would take time for, for farmers to, to, to be able to understand the idea of collection. Uh, waste managers also need to understand the different natures of, of the waste that they are handling. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you so much. You answered all those questions that were in the Q&A as well. So very good, Alyssa. So let's hear about what you're doing in Vietnam. I think it's the start of next year. Can you see my... Um, yes, it PowerPoint? just needs... Yep, perfect. It just needs to be all maximized. Right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so thank you again. And now I'll start my presentation proper. And Alison had mentioned earlier in June when I also participated, and we talked about how we applied behavioral science to understand uh, the uptake of PPE in India. So today I will not focus too much on what behavioral science is about, but just give an overview of the project that we're doing in Vietnam. We started this project at the start of the year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we are unable to share the results. So today my presentation is really just showing what are the parameters of the study and hopefully in, in the future I would be able to share those findings. So today's presentation we had a lot of interesting uh, discussion and, and that was also being facilitated in the in the chat box on you know what are the difficulties that farmers face in trying to apply pesticides safely. So in my presentation I'm really taking a step back to understand the underlying process of trying to understand farmer behaviors. Um, and just a recap of what behavior science is about. A lot of us uh, talk about farmer training and at CropLife, we also invest a lot in farmer training to help educate farmers on what safe application would be. Unfortunately, between that knowledge and action, there's a big chunk in the middle court context. And that's where behavior science comes in. What behavior science is about, very simply put, is to use a scientific evidence-based and measurable method to identify correct factors in that middle that is invisible, that drives inaction or action. And then based on understanding these factors through interviews, through diagnosis, through literature reviews, we design more accurate and effective training to change our farmer behaviors. So in the case of Vietnam, uh, there are a lot of concerns that they are incorrectly applying pesticides and this could be whether it's too frequent or too much, too close to harvest or using inappropriate chemicals. And what happens uh, when you do that is that there's a rejection of crop exports and this affects both the farmer in terms of his income, but also affect Vietnam as an economy that relies a lot on agriculture. So understanding this problem that we have here, we need to understand why are farmers incorrectly applying pesticides by looking at the context in the middle. What, what, is, what are these contexts? Um, we categorize them in uh, very simple ways here, just as some examples. There is the external context, which is you know, how your physical environment is presented, whether it's to do with weather that makes it hot, um, social context, the way that you, what your friends perceive you to do and, and how they perceive you according to that action. The way your mood is today, um, you know, really changes the way you make decisions, regardless of the circumstances. Scarcity in terms of income, money also plays a big factor. If we had all the money in the world, I think a lot of the decisions that we'll make in our lives will be very different. Uh, time is also obviously uh, uh, another issue. You know, when we are pressed for time, we may make certain decisions that we wouldn't have made if we had more time to think about it. And the way the choice are being presented to us, whether it's in a retailer shop or the way that we are educated on these choices would also affect our decision making, regardless, even if the circumstances are the same. Psychologically or internally, we also have certain factors that affect our decision making. So in terms of social norms, uh, a farmer in, in, in America versus a farmer in Vietnam or Malaysia might, might make different decisions based on the social context that they are in. Hassle factors, you know, what we think could be inconvenient would also impact our behavior. 
uh, the, we also tend to have a human nature to, to think about short-term benefits rather than the long-term goals. So a lot of, uh, and, and of course, limited attention where we concentrate on certain aspects of the environment. And this was reflected in the chat where some of us were saying, oh, farmers uh, like really care about price. Farmers really care about um, the, the, the pests that they're seeing immediately. And they don't think of the long-term effects of how if, if I apply too much pesticide now, would my crops be qualified for exports? So these are a few things that we're trying to find out in our Vietnam case study in three ways. The first is how do they purchase pesticides? What goes through their minds? And I think uh, Putra had covered that a little bit also. What kind of relationships do they have with their retailers? What are the factors that influence their purchase? And, and then the second area that we're looking at is the awareness of guidelines on pesticide usage. Do they comply with the labels? And if they do, how do they interpret these guidelines? Are they accurate in their interpretation? And what are the sources of advice do they take beyond that label? And then finally, in the field, you know, farmers usually have been in the field for like 10, 15, 20 years, and definitely their experience also shaped their thinking around farmer practices. And we have to check whether those are accurate and you know, having farmed for so long, are they willing to change? What causes them to change? And so based on this, we have you know, developed interview guides uh, according to behavioral science disciplines and expertise to, to craft questions in a way that ask these questions indirectly so that we can understand the, the context, like the underlying factors that drive the way farmers think. And so based on that, we are, um, doing, we have planned for 90 interviews and this 90 interviews are spread over four major crops that are used for export, tea, orange, mango, and rice. And we have um, tried to do an even representation across four provinces, two in the North and two in the South. And beyond the farmers, we are also interviewing several value chain stakeholders, such as the purchasers, the manufacturers, the government, the retailers and academia uh, to see how they interact with farmers, what they understand about farmers. And so through such a comprehensive interview and behavior mapping exercise, we really hope to understand, you know, among the so many different factors and so many reasons farmers could uh, be using to, to practice ap application of pesticides, what exactly resides in this context and which buttons can we press in their, in their minds to ensure the desired action that we would like. So that is uh, my presentation for today. Um, I hope at some point in the future, I'll be able to uh, share those findings with you. And I think that would really help with some of the Q&A questions that were reflected in our chat today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jalissa. And that was um, great. And it's actually quite exciting to um, think about what your research might throw up. So we're really looking forward to being invited to your session <laughs> next year when we hear those results or having a special session uh, for us as well. Um, either way, um, it's going to be really interesting to, to find out what you come up with. So thank you very much for coming along. I'm going to move quickly now on to David Hughes. David Hughes uh, uh, is working um, on the health impacts of pesticides on farmers, uh, and he's going to talk to us about that. And I think some of his team might have joined us today too. So welcome to all of you who are in the audience. David. Hello, Alison. Let me just get my slideshow up. Yes, well, thank you very much for the invitation today. I believe quite a few of our team from Vietnam, Thailand, Laos and Myanmar have joined us today. And we're very much hoping that this will generate some useful contacts for us. So I'm just going to say a bit about how we came to do this study. Our main objective really was to build a public and environmental health research network that would take in some provincial universities that don't usually have uh, very much opportunity to get funding or build research capacity. And in a sense, the pesticides project um, was, was something that could have been different. We started our network by canvassing topics that might be of interest to our partners. And this was the one that came up as a pressing real world problem that they could benefit from addressing. Um, initially, it was my Hasarakam University in Thailand that had this idea um, to build a project like this, but the COVID uh, pandemic halted the progress. 
and they only got a small way forward, some pilot work. I'd been involved in some discussions with them about the network at that time, and I was able with a colleague here in the UK to get some global challenges research fund money to take the project forward. And that, that's how we came to do it. Um, you can find full um, information on my methodology in a published paper that came out uh, just in September in plus one. The full reference is at the end of this. Um, basically, our study uses a combination of a structured interview with farm workers and a finger prick capillary blood test, which looks at um, ACHE levels in blood which are markers of um, organophosphates and carbamate exposure. So in outline, the, the characteristics of a study is that um, we have uh, now three country cases, each of which takes three districts in a single province. The focus is on vegetable farmers. We only take one member of a household. Um, and we use the blood tests and the structured interviews in combination. The blood tests um, would pick up these particular pesticides. Our interviews do cover other pesticides as well, and they look at farming practices, knowledge, risk, self-protective behavior, and perceived impacts on health. Unfortunately, we had to abandon fieldwork in Myanmar due to a military coup and uh, the, the, the armed conflict actually in Shan State. Um, so, so we made uneven progress under difficult conditions, really. Um, research fieldwork is complete in Thailand, um, even though there were periods when it was difficult to do fieldwork. Um, in Vietnam and Laos, um, we have now done almost all the interviews, but unfortunately in those countries, we could not do blood tests because of difficulty in transporting the kits across the borders at that time. And the current situation in Laos where it's not possible to travel. Um, we've had to make um, adjustments to the methodology in most countries in Vietnam. They've used a lot of PPE to um, make field work safer. And in Laos, the team have had to do telephone interviews in the main. We have a big problem as well because um, global challenges are much less flexible than, uh, than Croatia in extending funding. So our funding has now really ended. Um, looking at the relevance to your work plan, we don't really investigate the full range of decision-making factors, but we do collect data on types of crops, prior training and preparation, knowledge about safe and unsafe practices, and use of self-protective behaviors, as well as self-reported health effects. We've only got very provisional results from Thailand so far on an incomplete data set, but we are basically finding that more than 17% do have potential health impacts based on the level of ACHE in blood tests, and that more than 25% others have possible impacts. Looking more widely, um, and this is very, very provisional, the paradox is that the farmers do seem to have quite good knowledge. Over 90% said they received training on safe use of pesticides. And when we ask questions about good and bad practices, uh, around 90% got the majority of questions right. They also scored highly on knowledge of health protective practices, yet um, over 20% reported psychological symptoms associated with pesticide exposure, and over 30% uh, reported skin itching and 20% skin rash rashes. So it doesn't seem that good knowledge translates into zero health effects. And so one would imagine that the wider range of decision-making factors that people have mentioned would enter into uh, the decision-making so that 
their health impacts on themselves are not sufficient really to uh, deter farmers from using pesticides inappropriately. So the current situation is that um, basically we need to complete the blood test in two countries. We face the problem of getting further funding, but we do have our protocol published. So I'm going to leave it there. I hope you can hear me. We can indeed, and thank you very much. And that was really interesting, just the um, that the good knowledge didn't translate into good practices. So it wasn't a case of a lack of knowledge. So thanks, David, and we'll have some questions for you later. But I'm going to pass on now to Errol. Um, Errol per Pereira. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, Errol. Can you, can you, you'll be able to correct me, but welcome. Um, Errol is working uh, as a consultant uh, to the ASEAN, to the ASEAN, um, I guess, organization, secretariat uh, for the, the 10 Southeast Asian member states. Uh, and he's doing some work around a stock taking uh, exercise for agrochemicals in the region. So we invited him today so that we could all learn, learn about what's happening and, and make sure that uh, we're contributing to that where we can. Welcome. Thanks so much again, Alison. And uh, nice meeting all of you as well. Uh, just, uh, uh, I just got notified of this meeting uh, just yesterday by Alison. So please excuse me because I haven't got any slides or anything. I'll do a quick uh, uh, explanation or briefing on uh, where I come from and all this. But basically, um, uh, we're working with the ASEAN Secretariat uh, on two important things. One is uh, uh, exactly as uh, Alison said, we are trying to uh, we're doing a stock take on all the agrochemicals actually. It's not just uh, uh, limited to pesticides, it's uh, the pesticides, fertilizers, uh, uh, all the input material used in uh, agriculture and uh, also the natural uh, uh, organic uh, inputs as well, uh, which is a big ask as well. But the uh, um, background behind this all is, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you a bit about myself and where I come from also. Uh, basically, I'm based in uh, Malaysia. Uh, we are uh, essentially a research-based organization here, but uh, we've had, uh, I've had 35 years, I think, of being uh, a sustainable farmer and teaching uh, sustainable farming all over uh, uh, the ASEAN region and also in Asia. Uh, we've worked in various uh, degrees and things. And now actually the, uh, one of the big things we're doing for ASEAN is we're developing ASEAN's uh, sustainable and uh, circular agriculture guidelines. Uh, and this is, uh, the stock taking is actually a part of uh, that whole thing. We have uh, uh, gone through really a considerable amount of things. Uh, we recently also uh, put out a lot of uh, questionnaires for people. We've, we've actually, through the 35 years, we've actually uh, had a huge amount of experience within ASEAN. Uh, and obviously uh, got to know, know a lot of communities. This push by ASEAN is a really important one because uh, I'm really, really happy to see all the work that all of you have been doing, uh, actually, uh, because it really helps. It really helps me to understand further uh, the problems we are having uh, uh, in this region. Basically, ASEAN has to come out with uh, uh, a new way of, well, uh, this sounds old actually, but it has to come, come out with workable practical solutions. We know a lot of the problems uh, that are going on both, both scientifically and uh, also in practice. 
And uh, we're looking for ways, as you all have been explaining, we're looking for ways to overcome this. And at the end of the day, uh, the policymakers uh, have to decide uh, how to do this. We're trying to establish practical guidelines on the way forward. I mean, all this talk about sustainability, we've had uh, basically, uh, when GAP was introduced, introduced uh, good agricultural practices was uh, introduced. We already had a lot of these, uh, uh, many very, very, very good guidelines. But obviously, the fact that we are still studying it today, uh, many of these uh, problems that we have is, uh, they haven't gone away. Uh, uh, they haven't gone away. In fact, we've uh, not found very good uh, solutions to some of these problems. One of them, is of course this uh, problem with uh, the overuse of pesticides, the overuse of fertilizers now. That plus uh, the, the fact that uh, world's markets are changing. The world's markets are being more defined now and with the problems with our environment, with the problems with COVID, it is uh, uh, really exaggerated all the uh, problems we have on true sustainability. Uh, ASEAN itself has got less and less competitive. We spend huge amounts on inputs uh, and uh, we are not particularly getting any more productive. I mean, we are, but uh, not for the amount of uh, extra inputs we're putting in. We still yeah. have this problem where we have a majority of people that uh, are engaged in agriculture, but they are uh, not well off. And they still suffer from the same um, problems of, uh, that we have in uh, the usage of uh, these uh, pesticides. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we uh, are looking at now is also markets uh, like the European Union, uh, targeting the uh, highly hazardous pesticides and uh, basically uh, wanting to uh, stop import of all foods that are okay. being with these. Uh, okay, yeah. I'm going to stop you here. No problem, no problem. But I've got a bit of reverb, I think. I hopefully people don't hear that. But listen, Errol, I'm going to ask you the first question. So I'm going to ask a question to each. No um, and I'm just going to sum up because I, I did have the letter here that went out to um, different uh, representatives across uh, the ASEAN governments. And it was that the objectives of the stock taking are to take stock on the use of agrochemicals and natural agricultural inputs into agricultural crops in the ASEAN region. Two, assess the level of harmonization of pesticides, MRLs, standards among member states. And yep. three, identify constraints and challenges. And four, provide recommendations to overcome them to promote uh, the ASEAN member state compliance with a common set of ASEAN harmonized MRL standards. So that sounds like a big project. So good luck with that. But <laughs> just a really key, a key question, because it's a very important project. What's the timeline? When are you hoping to have finished that work? And when can you come and report back to us with the results? Yeah, this, uh, actually, we're, we've got a, even a, a further questionnaire that was put out uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the AMS as well. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll send that on to you. I'm very really sorry, like I said, that wasn't uh, uh, no, no this problem. last minute it's, thing. And, it's just uh, an update. So that's it's, yeah. it's just to make people aware yeah. of what's happening and that there's a yeah. work going on in ASEAN to look at this. And I'm sure people will be interested. And if you can share that, I will pass it on with um, to participants yeah. where I can. So thank you no very problem. much. Uh, yeah, um, just yeah. what was your end date though? What was the end date of the study? Uh, basically, we have to uh, get, let me see. Uh, we, in, it's November, uh, November, somewhere around the middle of November. Okay, next year, this year. Uh, this year. Oh my goodness, right. Well, we'll be interested. 
<laughs> You've got a lot to do. So got got, to... Uh, ASEAN is a very, uh, this is the FAFT. So yep. basically uh, it has a very, uh, uh, we are uh, really uh, wanting to make uh, yep. this thing. We see this as uh, quite uh, urgent as well. Excellent. Got the, the main ideas uh, around, we, we still like as much information as we can. I, I think what work you all are doing is really, really good, actually. Okay. Uh, and what we need to do is work uh, practical solutions into, in the end, to give to our policymakers to actually see if we can make a change uh, this time. Okay. But anyway, right. that's the Okay, thank you very much, Errol. And I'm going to ask a quick question okay. to David now. David, um, you talked about, I think that when you looked at some of that early data, and I know it's just early data, but I think you had 17% were potentially quite high levels. Yes. Uh, yes and 25% were moderately high. That's about 42%. So, I mean, is that translating into quite serious health impacts? I mean, how, how serious is that? Well, one would have to follow the, the respondents over a period of time, I suppose, but pesticides exposure has been associated in the literature with very serious health impacts, both for the person themselves and, for example, unborn children because of birth defects and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, I think that would be another study, really, though, to, to okay. follow but, through. But is that 17% quite high? That's quite high. Translates into um, quite high levels. Yes, it, it's probably comparable with a few past studies that have been done in the region that have used the same kind of tests. Um, okay. But it, it certainly made me think that there are interesting relationships to explore in the data to see if there are any patterns whereby different degrees of knowledge or different practices do appear to equate to different levels of exposure. Yep, excellent. Okay, thank you, David. Delissa, I've got the last question for you, and it will have to be, you have to be sort of fairly brief, but I'm going to ask you a complex question here or one that you could probably talk for a long time. So please be brief. But we, I asked this question before to Eve about the the potential to professionalize the pesticide application um, industry, I guess, or, or, or make that more of a professional um, activity. What's your opinion on that? Um, actually, pest control operators all should be tra trained or licensed by the Ministry of Ag Agriculture. But I think a step further recently is the development of drones, and that would really help to also reduce the exposure of human operators in the field. Mm -hmm. And, and at CropLife, we also try to encourage governments to begin a training and licensing um, certification process for drone operators uh, to use drones safely in the field to spray pesticides. That will be my brief answer. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. And that, that's another topic for another great session, I think, is drones and um, digital IPM and pesticide use that we're working on as well. So I look forward to talking to you about that further. Um, that brings me to the end of the, the three sessions on an update on future research or research that is happening right now. And I'd now like to introduce our last speaker of the day, another quick fire session. Uh, I'd like to welcome Thomas Jackal to the... Um, to the floor, to the virtual room. Thank you so much for joining us. And you're going to give us some food for thought, sort of closing thoughts, big picture type thinking for us to take away. So, so please, uh, please start. Yeah. Do I have to upload my presentation? Uh, that, I can upload it or would you like to yeah, upload it? Yeah, you can, you can upload it. it would okay, nice. wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, let me just bring this. Sorry, I'm just going to move through this a little yeah, bit. Yeah, take your time. Well, uh, I see uh, it. Thank, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Alison, for this invitation. Uh, actually, I was not planned, uh, right? And uh, um, uh, yeah, I found it very interesting so far, uh, uh, the whole session today and also the, the previous sessions. And uh, uh, maybe just an ex explanation. I'm, I'm working in the regions in 30 years in plant protection. 
uh, at the regulatory level, but also uh, in field testing. I have been field testing in uh, every crop you can imagine. So uh, that is why uh, I have, uh, of course, also interest in, in, this, in this topic. And um, as we have heard now a lot, also in the last uh, uh, seminar already, a lot about uh, yeah, uh, pesticides and humans, uh, human risks, uh, communication with farmers, and so on and so on. I want to raise a little bit at the end the environmental view on that, um, because that was also touched upon today. And um, yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so I think, um, and if you look uh, uh, at ASEAN as a region um, that was also uh, discussed just previously, uh, previously in the presentation. So the uh, one question is, uh, is very what is important and what is uh, relates to the use of pesticides is in which direction is ASEAN agriculture going? So uh, uh, are we going in an industrial style monoculture uh, agriculture style? Yeah. Um, with with big area, or are, do, uh, are we heading towards diversified agroecosystems, which ex actually actually already exist here in uh, in Southeast Asia, because uh, the the land situation is patchy, uh, or is it somewhere in the middle? So um, uh, the structure uh, or the answer to this, in which time, how is agriculture be done, at what level, and uh, that will also of course determine uh, the input requirements regarding pesticides. The next slide, please. So uh, I just want to, to outline that uh, pesticides impact not only on human health, also on ecosystem health. And um, uh, one of the, the previous uh, presenters said that yeah, we, we don't know uh, yet so much about the ethic. At least we know already some, um, uh, some, uh, some hard facts. What are the impacts uh, on, on ecosystems? And uh, what we know for a long time, that is, for instance, that more broad spectrum pesticide means reduced biodiversity on farms. Yeah, there have been numerous studies on that, uh, a, a recent one in science from 2015. And uh, we also know uh, that uh, non-crop habitats uh, strengthen the natural biocontrol function or the ecosystem service yeah, in terms of control of, of pests. And uh, we know also now that adjacent forests increase, for instance, agricultural soil biodiversity. Yeah? So um, the, um, uh, the fact of biodiversity is very important for keeping pests in control. Yeah? And um, um, I want to highlight here also um, the very important work of Jules Pretty for more than 20 years now, which has shown in many countries that actually reducing broad spectrum pesticides uh, strengthens environmental services, which in turn increases yield. So we have in almost every crop worldwide where we have proper IPM programs where uh, pesticides are reduced and especially broad spectrum pesticides uh, are reduced, which, which uh, indiscriminately kill uh, all insects, um, also the, the beneficial insects. Yeah? We see removing pesticides increases yields. So it's actually contrary to what is always told to farmers. Um, and there are a few crops, for instance, wheat is one crop where really more pesticides means uh, uh, better protection and higher yields. But in the rest of it, including vegetables and fruit trees, you can see reducing uh, broad spectrum pesticides um, improves the natural biocontrol function, uh, which is crucial for, uh, for natural pest management. Next, please. Uh, and then just a Short comment to uh, IPM, Integrated Pest Management. We talked a lot about communication. So IPM has many definitions, okay? And there are as many definitions as people uh, yeah, phrasing them. So uh, um, IPM uh, means Integrated De Pest and Disease Management. It's not meaning Integrated Pesticide Product Management. And unfortunately, still today, uh, the IPM is uh, by many people translated in, in the latter way. It's not pesticide management. The focus is on the pest, not on the, the tool. Um, and then another fallacy that uh, I still today um, I see is that IPM um, is held responsible for, uh, for increasing yields. Uh, so that pest management is there to increase yields. No, it's not. Uh, pest management is there 
for preventing reducing losses due to pests and diseases. And that is a very important distinction, because if you use the latter connotation, that it increases yields, farmers make the wrong decisions, make the wrong decisions. And um, uh, they make uh, the wrong agronomic decisions, because if they wanted to increase yields, or improve the productivity of their land, uh, they would need to improve soil health, they would need to choose the right crop variety, they would improve, need to improve in, in water management and other cultural practices. So these matter most. So the focus on pest management uh, distracts actually from those uh, um, uh, yeah, measures or from those practices that are crucial for the yield improvement. And uh, uh, connected with that is, of course, uh, selling pesticides are still sold today. And this is a communication matter as a magic bullet for everything, yeah, for increasing yields. And sorry, that's not the case. And uh, this is actually uh, contrary to, uh, uh, to the real situation. And uh, just one uh, anecdote, you know, I've seen now in many countries in Southeast Asia, there are still uh, some countries in banks in some countries that uh, if they offer loans to farmers to buy the seeds for their rice field, uh, mandate a pesticide package. Yeah, How come that banks um, uh, go into the pest, pest management business? Uh, so so there, there, there are many aspects with regard to the IPM, how we address IPM, how we communicate IPM, what it is. And um, if uh, one last point to the IPM, if we talk about IPM, uh, we have also to realize that many pests need community action. So it's not a single farmer issue. Uh, more, many pests, brown pan, top and rice, uh, uh, f uh, um, uh, f flies in, in, in fruit trees, need area-wide management uh, on the community level. So forget about talk about single farmer action uh, uh, on certain pests. Rodents, uh, the same story. Without community action, there is no proper rodent control. So uh, this to the topic IPM. Next, please. Um, and then we hear now, we saw, I saw in the title of this seminar that uh, newer, newer pesticides are, are less toxic. Um, again, I want to, uh, to underline here, we, we, we talked a lot of human toxicity here and human health risk and so on, but there are also environmental uh, and other non-target risks. And um, in fact, the newer synthetic pesticides are more toxic to non-target insects or many arthropod species. Uh, uh, the toxicity has gone up. So um, uh, there has been a famous study uh, on uh, neonicotinoid residues in honeybees. Probably you know that, that has been uh, discussed uh, worldwide. And uh, there was recently a study in, in science in 2021 that showed very clearly, uh, you know, studying 200 or 300 uh, active ingredients of new substances, the per weight active ingredient toxicity against arthropods on insect has increased in newer pesticides. So don't be mistaken about this. Um, and then I want to have, I have a personal uh, also comment here. If we talk about environmental effects um, and uh, that's what I want to give an example. Why is fipronil still used in aquatic systems like rice. It's still registered in some countries in Southeast Asia. If we know since 20 years, it's extremely toxic to aquatic organisms and bees. So we know already some of the detrimental environmental effects of some of uh, the active ingredients we are using. So I see here also a clear failure of the re regulatory action. And um, uh, this has to be addressed. This, this is not a problem of the farmer. This is a problem uh, that has to be solved at the regulatory level. And there are other substances I could cite here. Uh, this is one uh, drastic example that's highly dangerous for uh, aquatic systems and is still used in Southeast Asia in rice. The next slide, please. So uh, I make it also very short. I conclude. Um, Yes, educating farmers about use of pesticide is important, but too narrow as a focus for the future, uh, I believe. Um, I have been working with farmers also since all this time here in, in the field. And uh, what I observe is that um, farmers lack general economic knowledge 
how to run their farm, uh, uh, how to calculate their profit. So they need general um, education, economic, agronomic, and ecological uh, issues. And um, uh, I have proposed many times, why not uh, elevate farming as a profession here in the region as we have it in Europe? Yeah? Let's say a two year vocational uh, education in, um, uh, in farming, which is offered by some universities here in Southeast Asia, yeah? vocational training, but it's, um, it's not formal. Yeah? So why not raise, uh, 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 put more, invest more, and address this to ASEAN? Yeah? Uh, why not invest more in the formal education of farmers so that they can make their informed decisions? Um, of course, and I've been a proponent of uh, uh, biological pesticides, the availability of low risk pesticides like biopesticides and biological control agents needs to be expanded. Um, uh, the market is growing, but for my taste, not growing enough. So uh, uh, again, uh, my, my pledge here to, to, uh, to expand this. Yeah? Uh, and then this was discussed previously already and that I'm grateful that it was touched about the professionalization yeah, well, why not take uh, pest management completely out of the hands of farmers? You know, I know this, this cannot happen uh, from today to tomorrow, but uh, I have discussed this with some of the, uh, some of the, the major companies. There are, of course, um, uh, uh, yeah, activities where uh, crop protection is offered as a service, and that could be a service industry. I've been working for, for two years in a, in a service company doing exactly that, that doing exactly that offering the pest management for customers. So I think there is more room for expansion here and, 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 uh, and then also, for instance, guarantee success to, to, uh, to the customer. Yeah? That would be an, an interesting um, uh, uh, approach. So last point, I propose we need a, a total crop management approach and ecological engineering. And especially if we look at the, the climate change, which is already ongoing. Yeah? Uh, so uh, my initial uh, picture regarding monoculture is certainly not the right direction. So uh, uh, agriculture, monoculture, large scale agriculture, monoculture with high input is not sustainable and is even less sustainable in view of, of climate change. So uh, there are some ideas how we could do that uh, how we uh, how we uh, get uh, yeah climate proof or climate smart uh, one uh, citation sound one reference here but there are many others uh, so I hope this is some food for thought thank you very much excellent Thomas and actually that's why I invited you on was to give virtually the summary of the session but some food for thought for us to take away with us and you've done that very well with lots of great questions. Um, I'm just going to ask you one question. It's really just a yes or no. And it's, do you think we're going in the right direction and fast enough then? Well, um, I think we are, we are not going fast enough. Uh, uh, and um, um, we should, for instance, um, put in order some things that, uh, for instance, the regulatory level should be put in order. Because what we see uh, worldwide, it's not, not here only in ASEAN that um, uh, the regulation is not preventing actually the, the negative effects of pesticides. Yeah? Yeah. So um, especially in the environment. So, you know, also just a, sh a short remark, uh, the EU, so um, because the EU was just mentioned, the EU introduced formally uh, IPM in 2018. So come on, you know, even the EU introduced IPM in 2018. You know, just just two uh, four years ago. So uh, so um, uh, things are going too slow. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that that um, closing sort of statement. And I'm just going to leave everyone today um, with the question of why not take pest management completely out of the hands of farmers? I think that's a really great question for us to actually ask and discuss in another session. Um, but it does bring us to end of this workshop. So please take that question with you, everyone, and think about it over the coming months. Um, I'm not going to provide a comprehensive summary, but I just say that both sessions we've held on this have really emphasised the need for future work and a sustained effort to address uh, better pesticide behaviour communication decision making in a really holistic and systemic way that consider all the components of the system and particularly that regulatory system uh, as well and all the stakeholders. 
Um, we really need to understand motivations and drivers and pressures behind people's actions and what is in their control and what is not in their control if we really want to develop successful interventions and drive the change uh, that Thomas just said that we really needed um, so, so clearly. So we'll be continuing this work and we hope you uh, join us on that journey. Um, we have one more session this year on Tuesday the 23rd of November, so please join us where we'll be looking at some top tips for effective pharma outreach. Um, I would like to just thank again all the speakers today. Great to have you. Um, really interesting session. And I hope you've all got something out of this uh, to take away with you. If before you could leave, um, you could uh, answer one poll just to evaluate our session, uh, we would really appreciate that. Um, and thank you. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>